Growing plants, vegetables, fruits, all indoors is no easy task. Growers have lots of hardware and components to manage in their environment, but have never had a way to monitor and control everything from one digital dashboard until now. On this episode of Ambition Today, we are joined by the one and only Dan Nelson. He is the founder of Grow Computer, an IoT operating system for indoor agriculture. This is Ambition Today. These are the entrepreneurs, creators, investors, and builders who ambitiously change to the world. Explore the hardships and heroisms of everyday life while we reveal the key moments to leave behind a lasting legacy. This is Ambition Today with Kevin Siskar. What's up, world? I am Kevin Siskar, and you are listening to Ambition Today. Welcome to the second episode of season three. We are coming to you from our new studio in New York City. In case you missed it, last episode we talked to Taylor Jacobson. He's the founder and CEO of Focusmate. But today we are joined by the amazing Dan Nelson. He's the founder of Grow Computer. Dan, welcome to the pod. Welcome to Ambition today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. We're here. We're down. In, we're down in New York City uh, in Fidei in the studio. How's it going today? It's good. I got to admit, this is my first podcast, so I'm excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, let's take it back to the beginning, like like we tend to do. Uh, tell us, you know, if you remember, how how did you make your first dollar? You know, when and when and where was it? My first dollar. Um, I mean, I always did jobs for my parents, my grandfather. So, you know, we grew up in the suburbs and my dad, I guess I, this is where I inherited it from, but he was always a builder and a maker. So every summer there would be some project in the backyard, whether it's redoing the patio or um, replanting something, sprinkler heads. And so my first jobs that I can remember were getting paid for allowance by wheeling uh, wheelbarrows full of stone and dirt or wood and mulch to strategic places along our property for both my dad and my grandfather. Um, nice. Where, where was this? So this was on Long Island in uh, Woodbury. So it's about an hour outside of the city. So I haven't ventured too far, but that's definitely the earliest job I can remember. And uh, it was fun. Nice. Did you have any, you know, uh, businesses? Did you mow any lawns or anything like that? Or It's okay if you didn't. <laughs> I don't think I did. I don't think the, uh, you know, I, the entrepreneurial bug hadn't really hit yet. Okay. Um, I think well, there was always an idea, but there was not as much execution. Yeah. So let me flip it on you because I, I just think this is an interesting question. You know, what was the worst job you've ever had? <sighs> the worst job. Um, it's hard to say because a lot of them have been bad in different ways. Um, you know, I could look at my first job out of college at Ernst & Young where I had to travel every week for eight months in a row, yeah. like at 5.30 a.m. flight, didn't get back until 7.30 p.m. And that, that job really took a lot out of me emotionally, but it wasn't the worst job. Right. So it was, it was a really brutal part. Um, other things are probably the worst job, my summer internship at Bear Stearns. Okay. And this was right before the financial crisis. This was summer of 2007. And I had an internship before I went to my master's program for accounting. And I was at Bear Stearns. And it, I distinctly remember the worst part of it was that I was in the controller's department. So I was helping to track some of the trading. And the systems were so bad there that one of my main priorities was to take a printout from one computer, literally turn around in the office and enter the data into another computer. Wow. And this was in 2007, right before it all went to shit. And it's kind of, you see how those systems were built. And that actually was a lot of what the work I did at Ernst & Young when it came out was. And you realize how bad some of these systems are and what happens when information doesn't talk to each other. And I hated it because for me, since then, it's always been about what's the solution to that problem as opposed to just doing the problem all the time. Yeah. So any of those jobs where I wasn't building an answer, where I was just doing the grunt work because no one wanted to invest in the answer, those are the, the, the challenges I've always faced, I think. Yeah, I think... Uh, you know, unfortunately, that still happens today, right? Of I think I think it's probably better, but I think when you start to look under the hood of some of these bigger businesses, there's there's a lot of manual tasks happening that could easily be automated. Yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about this in a bit, but this is kind of the same thesis that we have with Grow Computer. Um, when you look at the the world today, every business is made up of different systems, services, data, um, hardware companies, software companies, and everything. And what we've seen is that if it doesn't talk to each other, 
it adds layers of complexity and transaction costs and stress and hassle and it reduces the efficiency of any business yeah. and i think that's one of the main things that we've seen from our interested customers and the people that we're going to be working with but throughout my career those challenges have always been brought up yeah and some of my favorite jobs talk about the worst jobs my favorite jobs were the ones where we're building solutions to those problems we see we're trying to track data and understand what the lifetime value is of a certain customer profile how do we figure out what the answer is and then build the solution so we can test and improve the the ability of the business or the or the team and those were the best projects where I was doing the actual report every Friday afternoon for 5 p.m. every week those were always my least favorite jobs yeah for sure so before we get before we get to grow computer you know uh, where did you go to school what did you study absolutely so I went to the University of Michigan okay um, I studied economics undergrad that's the big house, right? That's the big house. Um, this is a good time to be talking because after we just uh, put a beat down on Michigan State, everyone's <laughs> feeling much better than we did about a month and a half ago. So it's a good time and football season's always super exciting. And then I actually stayed for a fifth year. So okay. I did an undergraduate degree in economics and I stayed for a fifth year to get my master's degree in accounting for the business school. And that one year program is enough to get you to the 150 credit hour limit so you could sit for your CPA exam. Nice. So that was uh, my college experience. Awesome. Um, while we're talking about that, you know, I think this is a question I've been starting to think more about. How do you prefer to learn today, right? You know, are you a book person, a podcast? Do you like to sit down and have coffee with a mentor, watch documentaries, movies? You know, you just jump until you hit a wall. How do you, how do you learn right now? I think all of the above. Um, there's too many different sources of content and I think sources of information that in a modern world, you have to be able to take in information from all of these different pieces. So I love reading. I try to get through as many books as I can on the subway back and forth to the city. Um, last year I hit 40 this year, I'm around 30 already. And nice. It just allows me to unplug and focus on something else. Yeah. And so that's been a great way to learn and develop new new insights into industries, but also conversations, blogs, documentaries, podcasts. Um, is, I, that, is that something you do on the like on the daily? Like that's like a habit you have, you, you know, crush a book on the subway ride? Yeah. So um, living in Brooklyn, I know you're, we're neighbors yeah, out we're in, neighbors Brooklyn. in Brooklyn. Um, I still, I work remotely um, and our team at Grow Computer is distributed, even though everyone is mostly in New York, we're still distributed and we don't have office space. So I find that I work from home, but I need to get out of the house. Right. And so I, uh, I work in the city four or five days a week and the 45 minutes each way I use for just putting uh, my music on and putting my head in a book. Nice. And that's been a really, really kind of unknown benefit of moving out of the city when we did two and a half years ago. And I just find that that time is so valuable because not only is it doing something promotive like reading, but it keeps me out of my email box. It keeps me off of Twitter, it keeps right. me out of a you know a puzzle game or something like that that I could easily be doing instead. I mean, that's the great thing about public transportation is you, you know, you're driving a car, you can't do anything but stare at the road. And if you get stuck in traffic, you're just staring at bumpers. But with public transportation, you could be crushing yeah. work or a book, you know, for 40 minutes each way, two times a day, like that, that adds up. Yeah, and you know, an hour and a half of reading a day, four days a week, five days more a week, than, if more you than could most do it. Do. Yeah, it's more than most people do. And, you know, it's interesting. My wife reads avidly as well. And uh, she reads at home mostly yeah. because she walks to work. And I find that when I'm at home, there's too many distractions that I'm never able to actually read in my own apartment. So it's kind of one of those things where we've each evolved their own strategy. And I find that you're just consuming information and processing all of this information that comes at you from everywhere. It's a skill and it's a modern skill that we've learned and we, you know, our generation kind of grew up at those interesting points where, you know, I remember when we were in elementary school, I got a computer and instant messaging. I was in high school with a cell phone and college with social media. But you so also we, remember a world pre-internet, which is like wonderful. A, a rare, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So let's, let's keep moving yeah, here. So let's keep going. why, you know, let's talk about grow. So why, what happened? Why did you decide to start this company? 
That story is super interesting. And I don't know if I decided to start the company, but the company, the, the opportunity found me in a weird confluence of events, which Even is better. perfect. Um, so the story is, is that I lived in a shoebox apartment ever since I left Long Island um, until the time I moved in with my wife on Park Avenue. And so our first apartment together was the first time that I had outdoor space that was mine since I was, well, maybe ever, right? So the first year we moved in together, I planted a small balcony garden. I'm like, I'm definitely doing this. And I had a tomato plant, a pepper plant, some, some basil and cilantro and some strawberries. And I put it out there. I had no idea what I was doing. And I got two tomatoes and a strawberry. I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, and then the next year, I tried to improve it, right? I tried to understand how water flows, what the plants need, what the sun was, what the system looked like. And then the third year, I got in even better and dialed it in, like understood what crops to plant on this small balcony garden, what the, the light angles were. But that was also the year that we were getting married. And so the challenge that I was facing as we were going into that wedding season and going into our honeymoon um, of course, because my wife planned most of our amazing wedding, I was just <laughs> there for support. Um, so I had to keep myself busy with other things, but was how do I keep these plants alive for 17 days while I'm gone um, on my balcony in New York City? And that thesis was kind of the, the first step in what's become a three and a half, four year odyssey that we're learning about urban agriculture. And what's interesting is also at our wedding, um, my wife's uncle, who I never met, I never even heard from, heard of before, was we, I ended up sitting at, uh, at the brunch table with him the day after we got married, and he recommended a book to me. And, you know, as a reader, whenever anybody recommends a book, I put it on my Amazon list. Right. And when I'm buying other stuff, I usually buy a book or two as just a way to keep that flowing. And so the book was Abundance by Peter Diamandis. And that book really foundationally changed the way I thought. So first off, the whole book is about exponential change. When you think about linear versus exponential change, you know, linear happens slow, exponential kind of catches up at you. And one of the chapters of the book was about the future of food and how urban farming is starting to hit this exponential growth curve to make it practical and possible. And so those two things coming at it from um, kind of a practical perspective where I was like, how do I do this? Um, and I ended up building a irrigation plat, like uh, an irrigation rig on the balcony that never worked. Amazing. Um, but you're just learning and experimenting through that from my, from my side and then seeing that there's a real foundational opportunity um, over the next 20 to 30 years of bringing agriculture back to where people live. And through that process, it's fascinating to see the changes that are going on, the challenges, but also the people that are experimenting and exploring. It's it's interesting, and it reminds me of, um, you ever read Beer School? No, I haven't. It's a really good book. It's about the, the, the founding of Brooklyn Brewery back in the 80s in, the, in Brooklyn. And uh, similar thing, like they're just, cra you know, the, the, the one guy upstairs would drink the beer and the guy downstairs would, would craft it. Uh, uh, and just similar things. They just started, you know, trying to figure out how to build craft beer because back then you just had, you know, light, light Jenny cream ale and stuff yeah. like that. And, um, and just from there, like how the story grew. And it, it's, a, it's a really interesting story. And I, I love that that just came back to you, you know, having this problem at home. And, you know, it, it's, it's tricky. Um, I, I'm, I wouldn't say between me and my wife, I am the one with the green thumb. Uh, we have some plants. If I don't water them, they don't they don't get watered. Right. Um, and then last year for Christmas, actually, I've always loved going to California and seeing the sequoia trees. So um, my family bought me a sequoia, a sequoia tree, and I literally from, oh, the, cool. from the seeds on, I planted it and I've been growing it. And this thing is you know a year old, and it's it's grown from a seed to an inch and a half tall, um, but it's currently dying, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out why. I think it's because I turned the heat on. And it's blowing on it, but but we'll see. Um, so very cool. So tell us a little bit about Grow Computer today. You know, I know you guys are a software company, but you used to be a hardware company. What, right. What's going on today? Well, so there's a little bit more to the story that we have to fill in because I came from a background where I knew nothing. But luckily at that time in Brooklyn, there was this real groundswell. Um, and there was a community forming of other 
people that I call them second career people, yeah. you know, someone like me that came from technology and finance and accounting that was now interested in sustainability and urban renewal. And in Brooklyn, um, at a place around called Ag Tech X, there was a co-working space and it was a community of thinkers and people that were passionate. And I happened to know all the guys running it and was operating out of there. Nice. And it wasn't as much that I had something to do as that I had a thesis. And my thesis was that in order to take this world to the next step, we need to better integrate software. Um, I think everyone talks about the future of food is hydroponics, but a lot of people that are growing and experimenting in these businesses still don't have any ability to know what's going on in their, in their farms or their grows unless they're staring at the plants. And if you think about that from an operational perspective as a business owner, it's not scalable. It's not scalable, but it's also inconsistent, which is more challenging. So if you're having different representatives take down measures on a spreadsheet, there's no consistency there. Not to mention if you're having people pull mechanical levers or set timers mechanically, there's no insights into that unless you're there. And so we started to combine this thesis of what happens if we had like an app for that. And that thesis actually was able to aggregate people that were in the space that were also thinking about this. So the company congealed when I was working out of AgTechX and I met my initial co-founder. And then we started knocking around this idea. And that idea was captivating enough for more people to come on board. And over the last two plus years that we've been doing it, we've had, I think, eight people total. Currently, we're at five. and. Nice. Everybody has come to the business either because they're a part of the community or because they were doing, they were growers themselves and they realized the technological limitations for their own ability to do what they wanted to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're at the epicenter of this, right? I mean, <clears throat> Elon Musk's brother, Kimball has a, yeah. has a, a urban farming, you know, accelerator called Square Roots in Brooklyn. Um, Gotham Greens, I think, has the entire roof of a, a Whole Foods where they do yeah. indoor agriculture and, and then sell it downstairs. Um, you know, Brooklyn seems to be a a place that, that where this is happening. And so you're, you're in the right place at the right time. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, when you look at where a lot of the ag tech investment is, two of the largest indoor farms in the world are located just across the river in Jersey. You have Bowery Farms and Aero Farms. Each have raised over $100 million on these new models. Wow. Um, Gotham Greens is another successful example. There's even other unique companies um, like Farm One, which is a really neat business model here in Manhattan. They're in the basement of a Michelin starred restaurant oh, wow. and they grow culinary herbs for Michelin star restaurants. You have a company, Smallhold, which is creating an entirely new model of produce distribution for grocery stores. And there's, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's happening here because it's the largest food market in the country. And so the innovation's happening. And when you look at the people that are doing it, there's a tremendous amount of talent already in New York that's looking for this thing to connect to passionately. Maybe you can call it a millennial thing, um, but <laughs> after working in finance or advertising or something like that for a couple of years, people are, seem to be looking for something that speaks to them at a more personal nature. And they end up coming into this urban farming um, world, but they, they come for that. And then they leave for other things, whether it's organic farming or green roofs or energy um, optimization or other new types of um, business models in the space. And that's what's really exciting. And yeah. so for me, it's a great community. And we would not be here as a company to this point without it. So great segue. Uh, so where is Grow Computer today? So we are just getting back to where we had been. So as you mentioned, last year, we were a hardware company and we... The initial thesis was that we wanted to get people to a consistent software application that didn't really matter what was connected to the farm. Um, and I think that's the real challenge is that while the functions are the same in any of these systems, there's, let's say, 10 to 12 different things that everybody needs to control. Temperature, humidity, light cycles, um, water, um, fertigation, nutrients, photos, data, whatever it is. That, that's a relatively consistent set of functions. 
But the way that they accomplish this, there is an infinite amount of different configurations of lights and pumps and systems and settings and so on and so forth, but none of them spoke to each other. So we thought that in order to get people to a consistent software platform that was hardware agnostic, that we needed a piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. So in 2018, we had built a product called the Growth Strip, and we did an Indiegogo campaign. And the idea was that this surge protector, because it had switchable outlets, so we can control that um, with a computer signal, and then USB port inputs, was a universal receiver for any of those different things. And so we tried to do an Indiegogo campaign, and we learned a lot from that process. One, um, we missed the bubble on hydroponics. Okay. If you look, I did some research into it, and from like 2014 to 2016, like $8 million was raised on Indiegogo and Kickstarter for hydroponic things. Wow. Um, you know, I think the biggest one was this product called Leaf that was like a $3,000 grow box. But, you know, a lot of people invested in it, but none of those products really had started to deliver yet. So, you know, while the market got saturated, people weren't getting the products, so they started stopped looking at that as a solution. Um, it's And ultimately we realized that we shouldn't be making hardware. Making hardware is in insane. I was just looking at the It's bottom. very hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard for a reason. Um, but at the same time, because we're using software to control a physical space, we needed something that lived at that bits to atoms interface. And so what we realized is that, oh, the main functions are controlling electrical signals, collecting data from different spectrums and cameras and other sensors. That stuff's already commoditized if you look at Amazon. Right. I could buy a $20 outlet right now, which is the same cost as a mechanical timer that can be computer programmed. It could be automatic. I can integrate if this, then that. And I can tell you the energy consumption of it. And just those things, looking at that side of the market, how do we start to make those products available and accessible to the growers in the indoor agriculture market with that same kind of um, hardware abstraction layer that we really were founded in? And last year, in a debrief of the Indiegogo campaign, we said, you know what, this wasn't the right approach. So we, we pivoted away. And now our hardware approach is that we're going to be white labeling commoditized components. So rather than maintaining a supply chain, all we need to do is find those products in the market. And, you know, we've already started to see some really encouraging signs about our ability to access these things. But buy, you know, outlets and bundle them up. And that's the new product. And so we still do need some hardware to be sold, right. but we don't have to make it on that intellectual property. We're just kind of acquiring it, loading our software into it, and then distributing it. Yeah, I mean, I love that. And you know, you, you use the word pivot, which I think sometimes gets a bad rap and has a negative connotation, but I, I don't think it, I, I don't like when that happens. I mean, you did a thing, you were, you know, kind of on the mark, but kind of not. And then you got a bunch of customer feedback. You learned, and now you're now you're hitting the bullseye. So I, I love that. I love that you guys, you know, are, are finding your finding the niche here. Um, and so you're building the software, and you know, can people can people check it out? Uh -huh. So um, we're still in internal alphas right okay. now. So what happened this year is that as we looked at this new reality of where we wanted to go, we realized that our team needed to build a tremendous amount of technical infrastructure in order to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. um, most notably, it's if we're gonna be distributing any units to people, we need to make sure that they could work and that they those growers are gonna be able to trust our product. And it's the software that's able to connect to all of these devices at scale and then be able to update the information on these local edge computers. Yeah. Super complex doesn't really exist in the solution that we needed. Yeah. And so my two co-founders, um, David and Monty, who are the, the brains behind the technical side of Grow Computer, um, said it, this is a worthwhile investment for us to make. And because of our unique structure where, you know, because we're all bootstrapped and we're missionaries, not mercenaries, and we love what we're working on, we're able to extend the timeline of this to make sure it's done right. So to answer your question, we are collecting betas um, mm -hmm. in early 2020. We're going to be hopefully launching to um, that first round. And then it's looking like Q3-ish. We're hoping to be able to have a mass market product that can be distributed um, digitally at hydroponic stores, 
We have schools that are going to use it. We have people that are interested in growing everything from leafy greens and vegetables to cannabis, mushrooms, flowers, chickens, fish, insects. We've had people that want to use it potentially in a smart house. And really what we've backed up into is like, what's the lowest common denominator of all of this? And it's the IoT operating system is where the value is. It's being able to connect to an agnostic set of hardware and be able to do the same thing from a software perspective. And that's kind of like what Microsoft Windows did, right? If you think about it, in the 80s, you had Sony, IBM, Dell, Compaq, and until Microsoft Windows was able to create that operating system that unified all that hardware, software couldn't really be distributed because each software application needed to code specifically for the hardware. Right. So you would never see Adobe Photoshop, maybe on Apple, but in the PC market where things are still kind of ad hoc, you would never see that consistent software. And we think that by building that operating system that we're going to enable a whole new world of all sorts of stuff. And it's really exciting. And so if you're interested and you're a grower or you have an idea for a project, reach out and we'll get you on the list. And just email me at beta at growcomputer.com. Nice. Well, my, my Sequoia tree needs this. So, all right, well, let's take a quick break. We're here with Dan Nelson and we're talking about Grow Computer. We'll be right back with more Ambition Today. This is Ambition Today. This episode of Ambition Today is supported by the A-List. What is the single greatest piece of advice Dan has ever received in his life? Well, now you can find out the answer to that question by joining the A-List back channel. After every episode, we've been going longer with each guest and asking them that very question. If you want to access Dan's answer and the rest of our recent guests, you can join now at cisco slash A-List. We're also supported by Audible. Dan, you got a book you recommend to founders? For founders? Um, if you like sports and you're a founder, read the captain class by Sam Walker. All right. It is awesome. It's all about what makes the best teams in sports history, the best teams. And for every entrepreneur, it should be required reading. What's it called? Uh, the captain class. Captain class. And who's it by? By Sam Walker. Sam Walker. Awesome. You can visit audibletrial.com slash ambition today to download the captain class and keep any audiobook for free. That's audibletrial.com slash ambition today. We are also supported by Equity Token. If you're out there and you're a company that's fundraising or you're looking to fundraise in the next six months, then you need to check out equitytoken.co. You quickly get started by setting up your company's profile, fill in your fundraising information, and then the platform generates a unique shareable link to your fundraising deal room. You can easily share that link with prospective investors, and it empowers you to close your round faster. Mention Ambition Today when you sign up and jump to the front of the waitlist. Lastly, if you're enjoying this episode, then don't forget to leave us a review wherever you're listening. Apple, Spotify, Google, SoundCloud, Stitcher, blah de blah more and more, episode <laughs> breaker. They just keep coming. Whatever podcast story you use, leave us a review. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Visit Ambition Today online at Ciscard.co and follow the show on social media at Ambition Today. Welcome back. We are here with Dan Nelson and we're talking about Grow Computer before the break. But Dan, now it is time for the gauntlet. We're on the back half of the episode. The gauntlet is a new thing we're doing in season three where I am going to list a series of business categories. And based on what's working for your company right now, you as a founder, I want you to share one tip, process, or tool you love in that category. Sound good? Love it. Cool. You ready? Mm -hmm. Here we go. Branding and design. Get a designer. <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a way that you recommend people do that? It's the same way I recommend doing anything. And it's, or at least building my team, because that's what seemed to really work. It's joining a community of people that care about the same things and finding people that want to build, help you build it. And I've gotten extremely lucky. And with Grow Computer, we have a fantastic designer who I met through the community. And he not only gets what we're working on, but he, you know, he's able to really understand the brand ethos because he's been there since the beginning. Nice. So it's find missionaries, not mercenaries. Love it. Go to market slash marketing strategies. Test. Test and target. Um, build in infrastructure to understand the metrics before you do anything. And then 
do small tests. You know, you could do 20, $30 tests on Facebook, ABC tests, see where your conversions come from and build from there and let the analytics tell you what really works as opposed to assuming you know what's going on for the market. All right, product development. Which part? Up to you. Um, well, for the development part, come with a thesis. Don't think you come with an answer, but come with a thesis because the thesis in any conversation is a great lens when you talk to people that do experience this or do know what's going on. So if you come with your solution, it's oftentimes a yes or no. But if you come with a thesis and you could under and you could try to source the conversation for that, you'll learn a lot more about what people need and what they actually want to do with your product. All right. Next one is hiring and onboarding. You kind of already answered hiring with join a community. Maybe talk about you know how do you how do you onboard people onto your your company's culture and, and um, well, I would say before they join the team, there's. Yeah, we're trying to find people that want to be here. Um, we're a very early stage company. We have a pretty flexible work situation. So we're looking for self-motivated folks that can deal with obscurity. And so what I found that actually works really nicely to make sure that we have alignments aligned is first conversation with a prospective person that wants to join the team. I give them a homework assignment. Um, and I say, here's some information. Come back with something. I don't care what it is, but I think that has actually been a really good benchmark for understanding the type of people that we're going to need to work with in this level of uncertainty. It's that self-motivated person that will follow up with us that joins the team most effectively. And our most recent hire, um, we brought her on this summer and she has been nothing but fantastic. And she really took that to heart as she was joining the team. Awesome. Uh, last but not least, fundraising. I don't have any good answers for that. Um, Do you have like a CRM you use or anything like that? Yeah. Well, I've used um, Copper as my CRM recently, and I find that that actually has been super, super helpful. I don't really use it in the total way that it should be used, but I found that it kind of filters on your – it sits on your Gmail inbox, and it it filters any outgoing email or invitation that you send. So when you're kind of organizing people – understand who's in tag them as an investor, potential investor, whatever it is, then you can move them through that workflow. And I found that's starting to be helpful. But as far as fundraising, from what I've seen is that um, show, don't tell. All right. Love it. That's it. That's the gauntlet. Nice job. I was, that was too easy. I know. We move, we move, I got to add some more categories. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Well, let's keep it going. We're going to, I'm going to ask a little bit more philosophical questions here. So, Last last episode, I asked this. I, I worded this question differently. I asked, you know, how do you feel about building wealth? But I I don't think that's the, the what I'm trying to ask here. So I'm changing it. You know, what is your philosophy on, on building value and, and accumulating value in this world? Right? You know, what what is thinking through the long game? What what are you trying to do here? That's a really interesting question, and I think I've been thinking about it a lot recently. Um, you know, I mentioned a book I was reading. I'm reading Reboot by Jerry Colonna right now. And it's about radical self-inquiry. And, you know, the first couple chapters are about this topic. And I think for me, the thing that drives me to do this every day and build something that, frankly, there isn't even a market thesis in the for the, the product that we're building. Um, but when we talk to people and we hear what people think that they'll be able to do with our product, for me, it's about building something that can be part of people's lives that can help them do what they want to do. Um, it kind of ties back into the other side of my life with the entrepreneur, entrepreneur mentoring and some of the consulting work I've done. But I think entrepreneurship is the pathway for a lot of people. It's so difficult. But if you have the right tools, you can better optimize and understand your, your business and I think Grow Computer has a really unique opportunity to help people build whatever they want to build. Because if you're going to do something in the real world, indoors, that's a controlled system that we can kind of work with and help you track and monitor and control. And like I said, the things that people have said that they want to use our platform for is what, is what the most exciting thing in the world is. It's like for sure. when you could ask someone, what would be your dream dashboard? of how you would manage your business. What information would you want? And they rattle things off to you. And in the back of my head, knowing our product being, okay, 
when we're ready to go, we can check this, 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 and this box. Um, for a grower or even for a hardware manufacturer that doesn't have the software chops to build out all those shared services that we have, right? So now if we have a little piece of code that they can use to better connect and do everything that they would have had to build on their own, how much more efficient of a business that is. And I think it's those, it's building something that could really add value to everybody else. And I think that I've never worked on anything that has this much long-term potential. It is gonna, it's already taken everything, all of my creativity <laughs> to keep it alive. But I think as we keep going and we're, you know, I think we had the right team and we're in the right place because we're not stopping. Yeah. Um, that once we start to show off what we're doing, it's going to fundamentally change the way people think about certain things and hopefully affect how they operate to make them more successful, more scalable, um, or maybe even just have a better work-life balance. You know, we have people right now that tell us that they need to go to their farm, which could be 15, 20, 30 minutes away um, every single night at midnight just to check and see if the lights are on. And you just think about that as an operational cadence or a stress manager. Yeah, I like, think it's I think it's living in New York City. Honestly, it's kind of like we live in the future compared to some other places in this country um, by almost five to 10 years sometimes. Um, and I say that, as, you know, someone who grew up not in New York City. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, I think because of that, we often take technology for granted, right? Like I, as, as of this year, I can tap my phone and enter the subway, right? Yeah. Like that, that doesn't exist other places, right? Things are a little bit more analog and not always as digital. And, um, you know, I think we take that for granted a lot as New Yorkers. And I think if you can, guys can bring that value to the rest of the, the country and world, that's, that's immensely powerful. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think when just getting back into that, like abundance by Peter Diamandis thesis again, um, in the book, he outlines six D's, right, of what makes exponential growth. And some of these words I had never heard before, but dematerialization, demonetization, democratization. Um, to us, what that means is that now to get top of the line access to these tools, you could just have your cell phone, which you already have. Or, you know, it's just a really accessible platform and that's how it can grow. And we see these things a little bit differently here in New York and um, just that next layer of technology that can better connect the things that are already connected. Yeah. It's kind of needed. Otherwise, you know, we're still using Raspberry Pi and Arduinos <laughs> to build these solutions. And <laughs> if anyone's ever done that, it's not the best way to do it. So let's keep it going. Um, do you tend to pay attention to current events and news or are you more of a person who just kind of lives your life? You know, where, where do you fall there? You know, it's a very slippery slope. Um, so <laughs> I do follow news a lot. I've been an RSS guy for a long time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, old school Google reader person. Now I'm on Feedly. So I use that as kind of a, it's almost like my filter. So I could see a lot of headlines. I read the articles that pique my interest, but I see a lot of news and then, you know, Twitter is such a slippery slope. And um, so I try, I actually have two Twitter accounts and this was the healthiest thing I've ever done okay. um, for that product is that I have my professional uh, DNLs 113 Twitter account, which is like my professional outward facing one to the world. Um, and then I have my sports account because I'm a big Michigan football fan, Mets <laughs> fan and Knicks fan. And there was nothing that, and what I've learned is that like when you're watching one of those sporting events, the commentary that happens on Twitter is super entertaining and enlightening. But there's nothing worse than when you're like watch listening to a Michigan football game and watching on Twitter and then like seeing things about Trump do something ridiculous just to infuriate you. Right. So actually splitting those accounts and I found that um, I go with my personal, my professional account less and less over time. Yeah. Um, because there's just too much going on. You know, I think we talked about this earlier with the content filter. If you get too in debt into current events, it's just a slippery slope to get you angry and upset. And that's what the, that's what it's designed to do. But you could also use it as a way as like a great release from the realities of all that stuff too. Yeah. I, I, I connected Nuzzle to my, my Twitter and that's, oh. that's how I do my filter that way. And it finds all the top articles that all the, all the VCs and everyone is sharing. Um, 
All right, cool. Next question. What habits do you have, you know, to maintain work-life balance? You mentioned you were married. Um, you know, how, how do you think about work-life balance as, as a founder? Obviously, I'm unique. Um, I think the way that my schedule kind of falls out and the way that my my person works, um, you know, I'm more of a night owl than a morning person. So I found that um, afternoons and evenings are actually my busiest times. Um, afternoons, I have most of my calls and meetings and person stuff. But evenings is the one time when, you know, five to nine, my wife is a teacher. That's when she's free. That's when she's available. So we all, we try to make a point to do dinner three or four nights a week. Um, you know, going on the subway, turning off work, um, and just reading or going to the gym. And, you know, I do group fitness classes, which I find also prevents me from sitting on my phone. Yeah. So it's kind of these things where, you know, just understanding when I work and when I like to work, which is kind of afternoons and late at night, actually, which I'm most effective and um, optimizing for those to be quiet and productive times. And then everything else really work with the people around me to maximize that time. All right, cool. Um, good answer. So the, so another thing I've been thinking a lot about, right? And I think this is something founders come up against a lot, which is you're always hitting an obstacle, having to problem solve, right? And so, you know, where do you tend to find the edge of your comfort zone as an entrepreneur, right? And then I guess, how do you recognize that you're hitting the edge, right? And then how do you push beyond it to actually grow? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, the, the best way that I could explain that is, might be my best piece of advice, but this is the one that I've the best learned piece of advice I have in my career is only control what you can control. If you're upset that nobody wants to talk to you or that your sales aren't closing, that's not really something you should be upset about. Um, it's much more productive to focus on what you're doing and what you could actually control that influences those results. So for example, if you're not getting as many conversations as you want, send more emails or change the content of the email, change the tone. Um, those are things that you could do that are a lot more accessible um, and a lot less stressful. If you start worrying about the world coming down and things that are out of your control and you start to worry about that, it's such a slippery slope that and I, I learned this from my first startup. You know, I had a, I totally burned out in every conceivable way. Um, I think I stressed myself into a really weird health scare mm -hmm. that was super terrifying. But you know, when you're when everything is coming down and you don't know where to start, the things that you could do right now, or the things that you could do tonight or today, um, understanding what those actions are as opposed to the results and splitting those apart, and then analyzing if the actions don't lead to the results. I think that's been the most, the, the most successful thing to keep my sanity um, of doing a startup because it is the hardest thing you could do, um, especially at the stage that we're at right now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so how do you, following up on that, like how do you think about, um, well, I guess, would you consider yourself to have strong discipline? And if so, how do you, how do you maintain it? you know, with regards to controlling what you can control? Um, I don't know if I'm the most disciplined person. I'm not the most consistent person, okay. but I know what needs to get done. And yes. I understand the timelines of how it needs to get done. And coming from my whole, I'm good at managing lots of different things and understanding where they are and how they relate to each other. I think that's kind of my skill is the systematic approach. Um, but, you know, I use notebooks, I write notes, I put everything on my calendar. Um, you know, every two weeks or so I write a playbook. So Kevin and I are looking at my playbook now, which nice. is- I'm looking at your notebook here. Um, which is just kind of like high level tasks that it's not super specific about the next thing that needs to get done, but it's something that I'm tracking that evolution. And it's a lot of people. Um, so, you know, I have a CRM that manages this too, but I actually like writing it down because it helps reaffirm yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I, I use Todoist a lot for, for the digital version of all this, but I do find that there is just having a notebook and a pen and, and, and rewriting it is just, there's something satisfying or almost therapeutic there about, oh, yeah. you know, and, and to the time you line, you said, I probably do that, you know, once every two weeks, right? And yeah. There's, there's something there. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, th- I think it just it helps you focus it. And even if you don't go back to it, just the fact that you're writing it and you're spending the time and energy to kind of process all of that at once, um, I find that that helps. And, you know, I try to do it like Sunday nights um, every other week or so. Um, and it really kind of lets me see the tra- trajectory because I have everything in paper, too. So, you know, you go back from your one to the next and you see what works. You can do this digitally and it's, you know, tools, I think, are whatever works for you. Um, but I, I definitely like doing things in uh, pen and paper as much as I can if I can. All right, cool. Last question. Do you think about legacy? Well, that's an interesting question for us right now. Um, <laughs> yes, definitely. But I think that goes in, in the lines of why I'm doing this. Okay. Um, there's nothing that would be cooler for me as a legacy than to have something that is part of people's lives, right? To create something that can really help um, and help whether it's a teacher teach um, biology, uh, an entrepreneur building a better business, or you know, a home grower that's growing their own food or medicine or whatever at home, help building something that doesn't exist at all that could actually help them is the coolest thing that I can do. Um, and then on the other side of that is just how do you, how do I make sure that I carry myself to the level of respect and, and I get a level of respect that I would want other people. So, you know, hopefully be thought of as a kind, smart, helpful person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whenever someone asks me for help, I always make it a point to go out of my way and help, whether it's once or twice or over the course of time, you know, I think if someone reaches out to you, that's, they, they invested in that a lot of times, not if it's like a solicited spam thing, but if they're writing a personal message, right. you know, I feel like regardless if I could help them or not, it's my duty to put that time in. And I think just treating everybody with respect and hopefully that boomerangs itself because, you know, I haven't reaped those rewards yet. I don't live that, but I have to hope that every interaction, every person I work with, um, leave them with leave them with a good feeling and know that they could always reach out and hopefully that will pay itself forward over the next twenty or thirty years of my career. Yeah, I love that. That's a great answer. Um, well, Dan, thank you so much for for taking the time to come on the podcast and share your lessons. Where can people go to find out more about you know Crow Computer, you uh, your professional Twitter? <laughs> yeah, so um, growcomputer.com is the best place. And then, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about it too much, but, you know, Kevin and I met through Founders Institute, and um, I've been doing a lot of entrepreneur mentoring and teaching around a concept called Startup Economics 101. And so um, before Grow Computer and to kind of help pay the bills, I do virtual CFO consulting work. And I've had a chance to teach and work with a lot of entrepreneurs. And I found that there's a lot of these core concepts that just aren't taught properly for modern entrepreneurs. And so what I tried to do as a former accounting uh, lecturer and consultant and entrepreneur myself, um, create this content that hopefully can help people. And so Startup Economics 101 is the name of it. Um, I think it's info at startupeconomics101.com is the only thing right now. But over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be publishing and productizing some more of that information and very cool um, hoping to give most of it away for free because it's not it's not my knowledge but I think that the perspective of this knowledge of presenting it to people has really resonated with entrepreneurs and I it, you know the responses are usually fantastic and I'm looking to do more of that because that content is so important especially today well I love that um, and we'll be sure to share that up on the website along with the show notes and everything we talked about um, well, Dan, let's take this over to the A-List back channel for those members. And uh, everyone else, stay curious, and we will see you on the next episode of Ambition Today. Thanks for listening to Ambition Today. Be sure to visit syscar.co to get all the information from this episode and more great content. Until next time, stay curious, everyone.